You feel like that all you need to do is adjust the so-called minor differences in the present Senate bill rather than having to fight over beer and whiskey under the sales tax? Well, I think so. I think the vote in the House yesterday was very significant. Uh, they're ready to accept our bill. I think it's going to be a matter of us just sitting down and making minor adjustments, and uh, hopefully the House will, uh, will take it and uh, we'll have the session over with. It's a good bill. It's well balanced. Uh, it is well balanced from the standpoint of business taxes, consumer taxes, and luxury taxes. I'm very pleased with it. Looks a lot better now than it did a week ago, I'll tell you that. You think the House will accept a bill that includes beer and whiskey in the sales tax if the minor adjustments that several of the members said are needed in the present Senate bill are made? I think that the uh, compromises that we've made in this area have certainly been uh, very realistic. Uh, the House, in its initial approach, uh, felt that uh, this industry had been overtaxed already. It uh, also felt that you were placing a tax upon a tax, and this is a new concept which appears unfair to many people. But we've placed these arguments aside, and uh, in our proposals we have uh, endorsed taxing the alcoholic industry over $40 million, and uh, this is going a long way towards uh, solving a major problem. Former fighters often talk about the advantages and opportunities of the fight game. What are some of the disadvantages of the fight game? Well, the disadvantage of the fight game, as far as I saw the fight game from where I sat years ago, was that I had to make a sacrifice early. I had to sacrifice a formal education for boxing because I had to start early. You generally start at 15 years of age in boxing as an amateur. Then you go into the professionals at about 19 or 20. Well, all this time you're boxing as an amateur, you're forfeiting your career, you know, your scholastic career and the education. See? But education is so important. This is a real big thing that's coming now. They say that the automation is coming. It's not coming, it's here. It's been here for a good long while. And uh, if people are not ready to accept this automation age, they're going to be lost because there are no more dish digging jobs. Local government officials from across the Texas Panhandle have gathered here in Amarillo to hear a panel of specialists on the topic of regional planning councils or councils of government. Among the speakers against what they called middle-level government were Amarillo Mayor J. Ernest Stroud and Dallasite Melvin Munn. Mr. Munn, in essence, what have you told them here in Amarillo today about the Council of Governments program? I've called attention, Jerry, to the fact that we're dealing here with a designation of authority on the part of uh, uh, the people uh, by not, uh, in not having their vote. Uh, a regional council is designed to be produced by people already elected in counties and towns to do something else. And if this system is, a, is a entered without calling upon the people affected to vote for or against it, then, of course, it has been imposed upon the people. Is it your position, essentially, that we're getting too much government in this country now? To a degree, and yet this is a kind of declining step here. This gets away from units of government, so it works both ways. We, get, we have too much big government and not enough local, really progressive local government. To outline the good the councils of government have accomplished in the state of Texas was Dan Petty from the governor's office in Austin and Mayor Tom J. Vandergriff of Arlington. The most impressive advance, the most meaningful contribution to local government in my generation at least, has been this concept of regional planning, not simply regional government, because that's not what I'm talking about at all, but regional planning. And in my thinking, uh, time and history will prove us to be correct.
Coach Taylor, you're not unlike uh, a vast majority of college football coaches this fall. You have a decision to make, and it's at a vital position, that of quarterback. Uh, how close are you to deciding who will be your starter there? Well, I think we're real close. Uh, in fact, I was in, in hope that, uh, that we could have made that decision by now. But I think probably we'll make that decision a week from tomorrow, which will be the Saturday before our open game. And right now we have two boys at uh, Busty Underwood and Steve Judy that are doing a good job. They're both uh, uh, adequate quarterbacks and both have a good chance of being good quarterbacks. So uh, this is a, a good position to be in. It's not just like having one. We've got two that I think both are capable. Over the long run, this, uh, or over the past several years, this has really been a critical problem for, uh, for you at TCU, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Uh, for years and years, we've had a quarterbacking problem. Uh, we've had some good quarterbacks, but as you know, uh, to have a fine football team, a great football team, it's all based on a quarterback. And I think uh, in the professional league, this is proven. The people that have the good quarterback, are the ones that win. So we haven't had that real uh, big playmaker, and I hope that one of these two boys will be the big playmaker. Representatives from across Texas were in attendance in this meeting in Amarillo today, perhaps hoping to learn something of value which they might take back to their own metropolitan areas. Jerry Taft.